welcome to the talk show Cohesion Policy, 30 Years of Success, Past and Future. As 2018 marks this anniversary, we are looking at the way Cohesion Policy has accompanied the evolution of the European Union over these past three decades. Being the EU's main tool to reduce disparities, this policy aims at promoting and supporting the overall development of EU member states and regions. It is targeting not only the EU's poorer countries, but also the poorer regions of the EU richer countries. All in all, all EU regions benefit from cohesion policy. Well, you might not hear the term cohesion policy that much on, on an everyday basis, right? But get to, think, to, to get to the essence of it, uh, think of how much you hear the term employment. And now think that cohesion policy has helped create at least one million jobs in the EU between 2007 and 2013, therefore throughout the crisis. And it is the same when you hear investment, research and innovation, infrastructure, broadband and even access to clean water. Our talk show now takes place in Atelier de Tanner, a site in the historic Marol Quartier of Brussels. This historic wine traders hall from the 19th century. Abandoned in the 80s, but then brought back to life between 1996 and 2005 with EU investment cohesion policy. It financed not only the refurbishment and renovation of the building, but also the new working space for young companies. And interesting fact, today, 15 years after the project received its funding, there are 52 companies with 265 employees working in this building, changing not only the venue itself, but the neighborhood. And it is just one among many other examples which we're going to discuss today here at this talk show. And to open it, I'm very glad to invite to this stage European Commissioner for Regional Policy, Corina Kratzer. Please. Hello. Please. Commissioner Kratzer, why does Europe need this policy? First of all, I think it's an historic moment for cohesion policy. As you see, I think it's unique to have here so many people, uh, presidents of European institutions, the Prime Minister of Portugal, member of me European parliaments, uh, presidents of the regions, uh, so many people for, from so many countries and uh, uh, backgrounds. I think it's very important to be together and to celebrate. It's a moment of celebration. And uh, we would like to be very much aware about uh, this solidarity uh, in terms of financial means that you spoke about uh, uh, and they are translated in projects, uh, in social, economic, and uh, I think it's a very strong political sign just before uh, the adoption of the next uh, budget for post-2020 to show that uh, this policy, which is the most visible in the life of the people, should continue to help uh, uh, not only poor regions, as you said, but also rich regions. You know very well that they have still pockets of poverty, unemployment, so we have to be solidar. So thank you very much for inviting us and thank you for all of you for, for being here. Indeed, thank you to all of you for being here. I'm very glad now to invite to join this debate and to get to the very essence of it. Portugal's Prime Minister, Antonio Costa, please. Hello. 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 Prime Minister, tell us about achievements of cohesion policy in Portugal. Well, it's uh, difficult in two minutes uh, to um, summarize 30 years of uh, cohesion policy in Portugal. I would say that the most impressive is the way as we went up 10 points in the index for uh, the human development in, in uh, child mortality. Uh, in 86, when we entered the EU, it was 20 percent higher than the EU average, and today we are under that uh, average, European average. Today, we have infrastructures completely different.
different structure. The distance between uh, or the time to 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 to, uh, to connect the main Portuguese uh, cities uh, is reduced 30 percent. Uh, clean water, for example, it used to be good quality uh, for 50 percent of the population. Today, uh, clean water for 90 percent of the population. And in these last few years, we have not had the the economic growth that we had between 86 and 2000, which was 4.8. Uh, one percent, and we had uh, stagnation for different uh, reasons. Even during that period, we were able to reinforce the uh, cohesion within uh, uh, regions. Uh, the, um, the richest and the poorest, uh, the, the, the gap is uh, less 30 percent uh, to 55 percent, 70 percent to 55, and the deficit uh, in terms of skills has now. Uh, better uh, in these term in these years of uh, crisis in 2000 between 2004 and 2016 we were able to reduce uh, the uh, school leaving uh, in 35 percent um, to 12.6 percent and population between 30 and 34 years uh, access to uh, university for example has grown uh, doubled from 17.5 to 35 percent now at in university level studies uh, which means that even with the difficulties in terms of economy, in terms of uh, a new competitive uh, framework with globalization, with the euro, uh, the cohesion policy has been fundamental to transform Portugal and uh, making it uh, a more developed country, country, a more cohesive country. Very interesting example indeed, isn't it? Yes, of course. I think it's uh, a very good example uh, also in uh, uh, the way Portugal used the European funds. And I also would like to say that uh, we were near many countries in the last uh, year because of this climate change. And uh, we were with the people of Portugal during the summer when uh, um, these uh, fires uh, hit the country. And uh, of course, we had uh, this uh, uh, tragedy. Mm -hmm. And also, I would like to... to add that, uh, of course, we have a lot of research development, uh, as P Prime Minister said, but we have also this dimension of solidarity uh, in, to help countries in, uh, in times of need, as we did in Italy uh, during the earthquake, we did uh, with Portugal, uh, we have this solidarity fund. So I really think that uh, Portugal achieved a lot. Uh, it's uh, uh, one of my first visit uh, mm -hmm. when I became commissioner, it was in Portugal because it was the only country who used all the funds one year before the, uh, the ending of the program. So they are very good in spending, but in spending in high quality programs. And I would like now to invite to the stage our special guest president of the European Parliament, Antonio Tajani. Please join us. President Tajani, we've heard the example of Portugal just now, you heard it. What is the role of cohesion policy in building the EU as it is? But the cohesion, the cohesion policy is crucial for Europe. It was crucial in the past, it's crucial today, it's crucial for the future because we need to, to, to know very well our union. In the past, many countries with a lot of problems, thanks to the equation funds, worked very well in favor of European citizens. Also during the crisis, thanks to the equation funds, we will work against unemployment. And in the end of the crisis, we would have millions of new workers through the cohesion funds. Also for many countries, new entry in Europe from the East, the cohesion funds has been crucial for its participation at the same level in the most important meeting of the European Union, because the economic situation is crucial if you want to be a protagonist in Brussels. We need to have behind a strong 
economic position. And thanks to the cohesion funds, many countries, new entry, are today the protagonists. But I want to be very clear. Cohesion funds is a symbol of solidarity. But solidarity is not also to, to use the solidarity. It's also to help the other countries when we need solidarity in these countries. The cohesion funds are important, but when countries as Italy, as Germany, as Greece needs help on immigration, we need solidarity from the countries using the cohesion funds. We Italians, we pay a lot of money for the cohesion funds in other countries. And now we need solidarity on the refugees. It's unacceptable to have money coming from Italy, from Greece, from Germany, and to be against solidarity on the refugees. For this, the cohesion funds is a flag of solidarity. But solidarity is an important value, values for us. And for this, if we want to use this instrument of solidarity, we need to use solidarity also for the friends paying money for solidarity in favor of you. Thank you very much. So, Go, 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 please, Commissioner. I totally agree. Parole, Mr. President, I would like to thank you, and I would like to thank you for the entire European Parliament for uh, the support for cohesion policy. And when it comes to, to Italy, I think it's a perfect example that shows that we have uh, disparities not only between West and East, but also inside the country. Italy, it's a perfect example to show that. And uh, as the uh, President said, solid, uh, this cohesion policy is a solidarity in terms of financial solidarity. And you are right, we are helping a lot on, uh, on migration. For instance, we, we changed uh, the operational program. The problem is not your account. Yes, of course, <laughs> of course, but you are right, we are doing uh, the best. But as you said, I think uh, this solidarity should be uh, two ways uh, street. So it's very important to show solidarity because we mm. don't need divisions. And of course, net contributors, Italy is also net contributors, but also the second beneficiary. So I think it's very important to have in mind that if some countries would like to have more cohesion policy, more money for uh, big infrastructure, they have uh, uh, to have show solidarity also in times of need for other countries. So thank you for your words, for, for, thank you for being here. And uh, of course, I would like to, to pay tribute also for the former commissioners of, uh, uh, for regional policy and uh, hope together we will uh, find a solution to be together and to defend this unique project that we have on the planet, which brings 28, unfortunately it will be 27 countries together, 500 million people. And I see cohesion policy as a cement that holds us together. Thank you very much. And we're going to hear later, just a little bit later from commissioners as well. Prime Minister. Could you... Well, I'd like to... Uh to agree uh, with uh, President Tajani, because uh, the provision policy is not just linked with uh, the economics, uh, it has with the fundamental values of Europe. And the uh, cohesion policy has been allowing the EU to bring the EU to uh, to bring the EU to the, each village, each town, each city of each country of these parts of our territory. It's the biggest linkage that we have from the EU between us and the citizens. So it's linked with uh, the European citizenship and the solidarity and, the, and of course, the defense of the liberties. Uh, the, we have a duty of solidarity to share responsibilities and guarantee uh, the international uh, protection when it comes to refugees. From, uh, of course, one government has to follow the others. And we can be solidarity with money, 
and others can be show solidarity to welcome those uh, who need to be welcomed and uh, to be protected in, 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 internationally. I would like to tell you that we have the video message from the President mm. of the European Commission, Jean-Claude Juncker. Let's all take a look and we continue our discussion here on stage. Dear friends, I'm sorry I cannot be with you today, but I can assure you that with Corina, you as well as Europeans, uh, European regions are in safe hands. 2018 is a landmark year for Europe's cohesion policy. And I say this for two reasons. Firstly, cohesion policy turns 30 this year. It's a time to celebrate its unique role. At its essence, cohesion policy is about making sure that the life chances in Europe are not dictated by a postcode lottery or by accident of birthplace. It is both about solidarity and equal opportunities for all Europeans. And in being so, it is a driver of our economy. It provides 8.5% of public investment in our union. From 2013 to 2020 alone, it will support 1.1 million small businesses. It will help more than 7 million people to find a job and almost 9 million people to gain new qualifications. But cohesion policy is not about millions and billions. It's about delivering for Europe's citizens where it counts, about making sure no one is left behind, about making a positive difference to people's lives right on their doorstep. But the second reason I say that this is a landmark year for cohesion policy is because we must decide on how a new European budget for the post-2020 period will develop. This is a highly political exercise and not an accounting one. It is about choosing what kind of Europe we want and equipping ourselves with the resources we need to build it. The budget must be ambitious, flexible, of course, and focus on areas where European funds can have real added value. That means that when it comes to regions, we must ask ourselves some tough questions. Do we want to maintain support for all countries and all regions? Or do we want to focus only in less developed regions or cohesion countries where needs are more acute? Such a shift may come cheaper, but in practice would mean that many regions in countries like Belgium, Denmark, France, Ireland and elsewhere lose funding. Each option has a price lag and has implications for the overall European budget and for local economies and communities. These are the sort of questions you should be asking on your show, and I look forward to watching your discussion. But whichever way the debate goes, Europe's cohesion policy must continue to live up to its potential, as it has for the last 30 years. This is my firm belief and my unwavering commitment to all of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. So we've just heard from Jean-Claude Juncker, his belief and his commitment. What is your vision, Commissioner Kretz, what is your vision of cohesion policy in the future? We're not there. We're going to, of course, we're going to focus more on future a little bit later in the show. But following the message, the future of cohesion policy. First of all, uh, I would like to thank the president. We are a team. I am part of a team. And... Uh, uh, he gave to, just gave a very strong signal in favor of cohesion policy, but he also he was very direct in telling us how difficult uh, situation it will be without you, uh, the, our our friends from the UK to to do this uh, trade off. It will be very difficult trade offs because we also have to choose uh, what we would like to finance. We have new priorities, of, as President Tajani uh, already mentioned, of, as migration, but also defence, European armament, cross-border control. These are areas until now European Union had no any attributions, and now we have to decide how to accommodate these new priorities into the EU budget post-2020. So, uh, of course, it's uh, uh, about solidarity, and it's about it, cohesion policy, in fact, after 2nd of May, it will be in the hands of Chief of States 
and the prime minister, and they have to decide if they are willing, uh, willing, they have willingness to pay more for the EU budget. But also, I really think that we have to modernize ourselves and also to uh, enlarge our own resources and uh, make a bit of uh, cleaning in our own garden between uh, instruments and uh, um, uh, and policies. And uh, we have to uh, start from our ambitions. Uh, what we'd like to finance from the EU funds. And then, of course, uh, uh, you know, Commissioner Rottinger said that 1.1% uh, from uh, EU27 GDP will be maybe enough. European Parliament is more ambitious with 1.3% for the GDP uh, from the 27 countries. Mm. So let's see how much uh, the member states will, uh, mm. will, know, will, will be willing to, to, to support cohesion policy. What is clear is that, uh, as we uh, saw from the highest level of the European Commission, we are very much aware of the uh, added value of cohesion policy in the life of the citizens. It's the only link that we have with the citizens, with the mayors, with the presidents of the regions, and it's clear that we have to modernize this policy, but at the same time, we have to keep, uh, keep it uh, at the core of European policy. President Zayani. I totally agree with the Commissioner Cretu on the political choice. The 2nd of May, the European Commission will present the next multi-financial framework. The political choice is what we want to do in the, the five years after 2020, or seven years. We need to decide the political goals. Of course, we need to work against illegal immigration, in favor of security inside and outside the European Union. We need to work against youth unemployment. If we want to, to, to stop the populism, we need to decide on these three most important political points. We need to use the money for achieving this goal. And the cohesion policy is an instrument for achieving this goal. For this, we need to put money for the cohesion policy. But we need to have also rules, because the cohesion policy is not cadeau, but an instrument for doing more. Voilà pourquoi il faut réfléchir sur ce this is why we need to reflect on what Ms. Merkel said, on whether we need conditionalities on the use of the uh, cohesion funds, if we need to set rules on their use. Do you have? Okay. There, there, is, there is in French and in English. It faut changer parce que, comme il a yeah, we need to switch. Indeed, with the Brexit, now we need to speak French, guys. French will be a major language for the EU now. And I'm sure our chief negotiator would be thrilled to hear me speak French. So we need to, to reflect on this. We need to set rules, the cohesion funds. They are not gifts. And we need money in order to, to make things work, to make positive things, to help citizens from countries from least favor regions or countries. This is why we need to be cautious and we need a political goal. And then we need to, to debate with the European Parliament, with the European Commission. And I hope that we'll have the possibility to vote before the European elections on the next multi-annual uh, financial framework, the MFF, if we want the citizens to vote. We need to tell them what we want to do with our European budgets, with the, the, the taxpayers' money. We need to tell the taxpayers how we're going to use the money. And I believe in the cohesion policy. We need to value it. We need to support it. And besides, we need to tell to, to the ones that receive money from the cohesion funds 
what they need to do with that money. What are the different political goals and aims? Because it's not private money. It's public money coming from European taxpayers. Therefore, we need to have a serious debate on the next EU budget. Having a budget is not uh, uh, spending and wasting money. No, we need a strategy. We need a financial strategy. And that's the case for the cohesion policy as well. We need to uh, seriously debate on the use and valorization of that strategy. To discuss it, I would like to... We have a very interesting block right now. Commissioner Kretsu has invited her predecessors to define cohesion policy by referring to one major achievement and contribution to Europe which this policy made during their time in office. Well, not everybody could be here with us today, unfortunately, but those who can be sent us their video messages. And the first message is coming from Monica Wolf Matisse, who was EU Commissioner for Regional Policy from 1994 to 1999. Let's take a look. One of it for sure was the 1999 Berlin summit where member states agreed on the financial perspective for the following years. And what was most important for me was the fact that we were able to secure the structural funds as a powerful means to support economic and social cohesion and that we managed to fight back um, the efforts of member states to reduce funding. And what's important as well is that we agreed on a reform of the structural funds, meaning on the one hand to concentrate all means on the poorest regions, and on the other hand to phase out regions that had reached the average GDP thereby showing that structural funding really was successful. And I hope that we will continue in that way. And looking at this picture, Michel, I see you conducting the Berlin Millennium Symphony, and I hope that we both are able to secure structural funding for the future. Nice meeting you again. Well, Michel Varnia, please, that, that's the moment for you to join. So chronologically, please, Michel Varnia, could you please join us on stage, European Commission in charge of regional policy and reform of the European institutions in 1999 to... to South could, you, could you please come and ask them this... this that's perfect to say. Okay. The Commission in charge of regional policy and reform of European institutions 1999 to 2004 and later also in charge of the internal market and services from 2010 to 2014. Please share with us your experience. It's not an obligation to speak English. Huh? No, no. <laughs> Just to give the proof that... The country... You could speak in Portuguese also. <laughs> I think we have to give proof that the cultural diversity, which is... The, the, the foundation of the cohesion policy is uh, still alive. So, uh, je, je vais, I will switch to French. There is a sentence I remember. In the first report on climate change, uh, it was from the UN in 1992. We were talking about environment at that time. Uh, this report had been written by uh, Gro Harlem Brutlin, a former minister of uh, Norway, and he was saying we need to reflect uh, internationally and act locally. And I think that this is uh, the, the po cohesion policy is one of the best policies of the EU. And I think that we have global reflection and local actions. Uh, the global reflection is the one of Jacques Delors, one of the European Commission president, and he wanted a cohesion policy in order to avoid any uh, territorial divisions, human divisions within a space, in order to avoid gaps. Because we are in Europe, in Europe, and this is a, a common place, an economic, social place that we have in common, and we had a risk of gap at some point. At some point. In my mandate, just like you today, I had 
to, to prepare uh, the, the, the budget, the future budgets. And for that global reflection, I fought with the DG Radio, and I'd like to thank the whole teams, and with the European Parliament in order to safeguard the, uh, that, that policy. Because in the years 2000, we had a debate with economic reports that were questioning the regional policy. Some reports were saying that it was not useful and there, there is a capital, uh, they, they, there was a report from a capital that I know quite well that was saying that we need to change it and make it a charity fund. But how can we save it through public uh, debate? Well, with several uh, associations like the CRPM, we uh, promoted some ideas. We wanted to show the, to, to, to make a parallel between the Lisbon agenda and the regional policy. And we decided to focus on the major European challenges. And so this was a bottom-up approach in order to safeguard and to protect that, uh, that policy. I could um, talk about many achievements of the cohesion policy and the, uh, the president of the European Parliament uh, mentioned, for instance, that there were some uh, far, far regions of, of Europe, at the, the Azores, so some islands. And we developed medicine uh, through uh, television streaming. I remember that from one of my visits in those uh, islands. And then, when I were, uh, well, I'm managing, uh, I'm managing Brexit now, and this makes me think about the Peace Fund. My predecessor had started this program, the Peace Program, in order to promote peace cooperation between the north and the south of uh, the island of. Ireland. I launched the second generation of the peace process, the peace program, in order to, to put it in mainstream of the European uh, program, to keep it in the uh, regional policy. Now UK wants to leave the EU, wants to leave our policies, and I'd like to tell to those communities that I'd like the peace program to 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 be still a tool they can use. And I'm quite emotional about that because my first visit as a commissioner was to Belfast. In Belfast, I met two well-known figures that received the Nobel Prize, John Yu and David Milton. John Yu died, unfortunately, and they both told me the same things with the same words in two different places. They said, we, uh, sit, at, we sat at the same table in order to discuss peace. It's not thanks to Belfast or to Ireland or whatever. It's thanks to Brussels that we did this. And I never forgot that sentence. They both said it. And now with my mission with uh, Corinna Crezzo, with uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, I'll m make my best to keep that tool, the peace program. Next commissioner who followed Michel Barnier in 2004, I'm inviting on stage Danuta Ubna, European Commissioner for Regional Policy yeah. from 2004 to 2009. Sorry, I have to leave yeah. because... You've got to leave. Thank you very much for your contribution. But before, before, <laughs> before, uh, I want to thank you, the Commissioner Creto because she helped my country after the terrible earthquake. Because there is Euronews, la voglio ringraziare di cuore. I would like to thank Euronews for everything that uh, Creto has done for my country, for all her help with uh, great rapidity to the populations that were hit by the earthquake that devastated Italy in the center of Italy. She was always available and ready to help the populations that were in difficulty, and she has done everything that was in her power to solve each bureaucratic problem, and I want to thank her from the heart for this in my own language. Thank you. Italy is a 
beautiful country in Europe. Dana Tube, you were European Commission of Regional Policy from 2004 to 2009, right? How has cohesion policy contributed to the EU during your term? Uh, well, I, I think I would like to say at the beginning that I personally have always believed that cohesion policy is the most beautiful European policy that really makes Europe truly visible at uh, the level of people, at local level, but also, uh, I think, make people cooperate. We, all the cooperation programs, they bring people together, they learn from each other. We have all the projects, they are looking at each other. And so, so I think this is something which is very important to understand. Secondly, I would like to say that uh, we, with Michel, we belong to the past, to the history, and as just belonging to the history allows me to, uh, to say that for me, uh, Europe has European history has been, first of all, about change, and cohesion policy has been one of those policies that have been constantly changing, adjusting to the challenges, both internal and external, bringing new instruments, bringing uh, new people. So this is something which, when people talk about cohesion, and some of them have this tendency, all those old policies, I always think that it's just terribly wrong, and we have to explain all the time that this is a policy that is always modern, that is uh, uh, moving uh, forward. And and then when I became a commissioner, there was a very special time in Europe because there was just the big enlargement and the 10 new member states uh, came to, to Europe with, uh, uh, with, with all variety of, of the new member uh, states. And uh, there was also the moment where I'm very happy that uh, Michelle mentioned Lisbon agenda because I remember when I uh, started as, as commissioner, everybody was saying the Lisbon agenda is dead and it was exclusively the cohesion policy that was continuing with Lisbon agenda. I think the seeds were there and we continue and there was commitment. We introduced the innovation and also social sensitivity uh, to, all the, to the, all the aspects of all the programs of uh, cohesion policy. And, and I, I think this is important to remember that uh, it was that cohesion policy made Lisbon agenda uh, open to across the regions, to all European regions, not only to rich ones, or, uh, which was sometimes the, the tendency. Secondly, I would also like to, to say that that was the, the time when uh, we sort of renewed, uh, gave new life to urban agenda. I remember the first summit in, in Rotterdam, I think, in December 2004. That was also uh, the time where we managed to add to social and economic cohesion also territorial cohesion. Uh, that was also the time when we believed we have now many more member states, they are all poor, we need more money, and we discovered that you can have more money by introducing the innovation into the financial, uh, uh, into the financing of the policy. And that was the, the time when we, uh, we, we created the four J's, the Jaspers for technical assistance, and also Jeremy yeah. for SMEs, uh, Jessica, and, and also Jasmine for microcredit. So that was also the, the time when we modernized the policy by creating the financial instruments, which uh, continue uh, till uh, today, and which increase the amount of money available uh, for the cohesion policy. That was also the time of um, growing interest across the world in European cohesion policy. I can tell you that was the time when we did it for China. I remember we did it also for Brazil. Uh, we also did it for Ukraine. So we had a lot of cooperation. Also, in, I remember still when I was in the parliament, the people coming from Africa asking me about the possibility of, of reaching out to the example of European Union cohesion uh, policy. So that was also something that was a sort of a novelty. But also what I would like to say, because I know that Michelle was doing, that you are doing, that uh, Monica did it. We all. Uh, were going to the regions, and I did more than 240 regions. I was doing it because I heard very quickly that there were places, there were regions and cities in Europe where never ever anybody came from Brussels. And that was something that I thought was extremely important, so I also uh, did it. And then, of course, there was the normal fight for everything, as you know, and just trying to convince everybody cohesion policy is something to, uh, that we need in, in, in Europe. So there was nothing, uh, nothing new plus the challenge of new member states, but that's another, where we didn't pass the exam, some of us, but 
uh, today, but, uh, but that was also the challenge. Thank you very much. I do know that you are in a bit of a rush, but I'm asking you to stay for a few more minutes because we would like to hear now with a video message how cohesion policy adjusted and changed between 2010 and 2014 from Johannes Hahn, who was, the, of course, the EU regional policy commissioner back then, and now he's European commissioner for neighborhood policy and enlargement negotiations. Let's take a look at the video. I experienced uh, the most marking moments when I traveled throughout Europe and I had the opportunity to see how our policy is implemented on the ground and uh, to meet with people and uh, people who profited from EU-funded projects. So regional policy is about connecting people, ideas and about the enormous richness, diversity and potential of European regions. In general, I assess the transformation of regional policy into a genuine investment policy as the uh, greatest achievement of my mandate. As for concrete policy areas, I would mention the introduction of smart specialization, the reform of the EU solidarity fund, the strengthening of cross-border cooperation through the European territorial cooperation programs and the establishment of urban policy as a central pillar of regional policy. One of my most um, remarkable projects I could uh, implement during my time in, in office is this uh, so-called peace bridge, where you can see here a model. It's a bridge, a uh, pedestrian and cycle bridge uh, across the river Foil in Derry, London, Derry, which I had the honor to open in June 2011. And the bridge creates a physical link between the Protestant and the Catholic areas. It broke down the sectarian segregation and increased the interaction and thereby the mutual understanding between the two communities. And I encourage citizens and politicians from the West Balkans to study and visit this project as it is an impressive and concrete example of successful reconciliation. And a timely reminder why we have to protect the soft border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland even after Brexit. Here was the video message from Johannes Hahn. Thank you for sharing yours. Please, Commissioner. Uh, before uh, uh, the Commissioner will leave, I would like uh, to say how grateful I am to see you so passionate still on cohesion policy. And I would like <laughs> to thank you uh, very much because, as you said, the many things we couldn't do alone. So we are going from one commission to another, building on what we have achieved. And uh, what uh, Commissioner Barnier said, and also Commissioner uh, Hubner and uh, my, my uh, colleague Johannes Hahn, we have uh, this unique feature to heal the wind, wounds that we still have on the map of Europe. It's not only uh, between Ireland and Northern Ireland, but I saw in my own eyes uh, this border between Poland and uh, Germany, Schlubice and Frankfurt am Oder, where so many people had died before 89 in a, a search for a better future. And now we have, thanks to the EU funds, this bridge. And in 10 minutes, uh, the young people from Poland, they can go and, uh, and in Frankfurt uh, to the university. The people from, uh, from uh, Frankfurt, they go to, take, uh, to, to have dinners uh, in, in uh, Slubice. So I think it's very important. It's very emotional for me. Cross-border cooperation is something that we did from Brussels, as you said. Mm -hmm. And uh, for, for us, it's very important to preserve this dimension, which brings us together. So uh, I really think that we have to go in the regions. There are 290 regions. And as, uh, um, uh, as, as Danuta said, it's very important to You increased the number of regions. I don't know how you did it. But <laughs> <laughs> because of the new member states. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, anyhow, you are very well known for the going well, well uh, it's so hard to, to go, but also I think it's very important to, uh, to talk with these people on the ground, to, to, to speak with mayors from the villages, from the uh, cities, from everywhere, to, to talk with NGOs. So, uh, I, I just want to say thank you to for my predecessors, because, of course, you had the same battle like me uh, now before the MFF, 
maybe uh, this time is not uh, business as usual because of Brexit, but uh, it was always, as, uh, as Mrs. Hubner said, uh, uh, a battle to show that we are able to modernize ourselves and to uh, uh, live up the expectation of the citizens. Thank you very much. Michelle Barnier, Danuta Hubner, thank you, thank you very much for sharing your experience. Thank you. We know that you have to go. Merci beaucoup. So, Commissioner Kretzer, we heard from your predecessors, and now it's your turn. That's now your turn to tell us, to share your experience from this term, right? As I said for, uh, from the very beginning, uh, I started to, uh, with the DG Regio, of course, and uh, m our services with our partners for the Committee of the Regions and from the European Parliament with the member states to see how we can uh, modernize this policy. Because it is true that sometimes the regulations are very, uh, very hard and uh, I am very sad to see, especially young people, when they give up to use our funds because of bureaucracy and uh, because of the lengthy procedures. So the first thing, it was to uh, think how to make this uh, policy simpler and uh, more friendly to the beneficiaries. This is, was my, my first uh, aim. And uh, from the first months of my mandate, we created this high-level group of uh, simplification because, as President Tani said, there, there are public money. So we have to, uh, to have this balance between the simplification and control of uh, how the money are used. Then we had uh, concentrated on the lagging regions because, according with our studies, we have some uh, regions that are coping with the co globalization very well in terms of research innovation, but uh, still we have uh, uh, regions that, despite of uh, giving them uh, uh, EU funds, they are still stagnating. And uh, according with our estimations, some of the regions are still below uh, uh, at the level uh, that they had before the crisis. I think this pol cohesion policy kept uh, uh, Europe together in time of crisis. Mm -hmm. Because really, the, you know very well as a Prime Minister, Mr. Costa, that uh, it's this temptation that in times of crisis, the first things to cut, uh, it is uh, from investment. So for many years, in many countries, for instance in Greece, uh, in Portugal. And in Portugal, during the crisis, of course, we, you have to preserve salaries, pensions, and uh, the main investment pillar was uh, uh, EU funds. So in Greece, we had years and years when more than 80% of public investments came from EU funds because of the crisis. So still we have countries like Bulgaria, uh, Eastern Europe, where uh, more than uh, Greece, Italy, uh, Portugal, as you said, Spain, where more than 60% of EU public investments are done from the EU money. So, of course, we are not perfect. We have to see what is going wrong. We have to adapt ourselves. But uh, I think we have achieved a lot through the smart specialization, through um, uh, uh, so going from the... Uh, in, more infrastructure to more research innovation and uh, small medium-sized enterprises, which are the uh, engine of every economy. So we are in, in, um, in uh, contact with all member states. Now we gather all the ideas in order to see how we will, will make the regulation. As uh, President said, uh, on the 2nd of May, uh, we will... Uh, uh, give to the European Parliament's uh, draft budget and on the 29th of May the new regulation of the EU funds. And what uh, we aim is to make um, the sim single set of rules. We'll see how far we can go. But uh, you can be sure that uh, our, our goal is to make the life of beneficiaries much more easily and also to help cities, mayors, we have urban agenda. This is a greatest achievement, in my view, during my mandate, that we have now this uh, legal framework to work with the cities. 
And before we go to urban agenda, I would like to, I would like for all of us now to take a look at the very concrete example of a cohesion policy project. Here in his reporters went to Finland, to the region of Tampere, to see what this policy delivered there. For a better understanding of how the European Union's economic and social cohesion policy has a concrete impact on a region, we're in Tampere, Finland's second largest city. And you'll see how different forces unite to put into practice a new economic model, dubbed smart specialization. Let's take a look. In this industrial heartland, they're counting on the huge potential of 3D printing to spark economic regeneration. This project, launched in 2015, is co-financed with cohesion policy funds. It brings together universities, a training college and around a hundred businesses. In this region, we have a lot of export and tech industry companies that are interested in 3D printing. It makes them competitive and allows them to go to international markets. The objective, too, is to master the full scope of 3D printing, different techniques, using plastic, of course, but also metal and ceramics. This research and development laboratory was specially built to test business-led innovation. And it works. For example, Anti has developed a knife that's unique in the world. The blade is traditional, but 3D printing enables the titanium handle to be shaped to the user's hand. The manufacturers can do better products. They can achieve lighter structures, more performance, more safety. A rapid time to market, excellent feedback from customers, two job hires planned. For Anti, the ecosystem works perfectly. I've been able to uh, discuss personally of the parameters, test results, what kind of pieces we have afforded, for example. The project has helped training standards evolve considerably. This young girl is on an internship here in one of the biggest 3D printing companies in Northern Europe. It's a unique opportunity. It's part of our study program, and it could help us to get a job in the future. Thanks to smart specialization, the temporary region has resisted economic decline and established a new dynamic. Nowadays, uh, we, can, we can see that uh, there are companies who are also investing new, new facilities in the Tampere region, uh, which, which are putting quite much money for more new production sites. So we are happy to think that we are, we are some kind of part of it. So this is just one of the projects that Cohesion Policy supports. And we would really want to hear from you to asking you, what does Cohesion Policy mean for you? And this is exactly the moment for you to take the smartphones and to use the platform called Slido, where we would like you to vote, answering the question, what is Cohesion Policy about first and foremost? and you have different options. Solidarity, economic growth, support structural reforms, equality of opportunities, bringing Europe closer to people, improving people's daily lives. Well, we do understand when we discussed and prepared this voting, we, we of course understood how hard it would be to make a choice. Therefore, you could choose two options. That's, that's the most we could get. Prime Minister Costa, you saw the example while we're voting, while the audience is voting. You saw the example of Tampere, of one of the projects What's your, what, what's your experience to share and your take to share? Sir, helped uh, answer to uh, different countries with different situations and circumstances. Our experience is uh, in industrialized areas where all the industries uh, like uh, shipyards uh, were in decadence and thanks to the cohesion policy they, and, and reforms and, and also in, uh, we, uh, and in the car automotive industries that now they access. In 
years of crisis, cohesion allowed to um, to help the uh, public investment in Portugal. 85% of the public investment in Portugal is financed by uh, community uh, or EU uh, funds, which means that without uh, cohesion uh, policy, without cohesion funds, uh, our development would never reach the level that it is. Like the Commissioner said before, it's thanks to the cohesion policy that we have uh, great support, 50 billion, uh, 50 million euros uh, to our uh, regions uh, or to that region that suffered a tragedy last summer. So. Uh, cohesion policy uh, should be also uh, supported and defended. After the Brexit decision, uh, we have to decide among our 27 EU member states. We have to be united, and we will do so, and reinforce uh, if, uh, security in terms of defence against terrorism, uh, of the phenomenon of uh, migrations uh, uh, concerning the the, uh, the future of employment. But all these new policies which are essential and the challenges cannot and the answers to these challenges cannot be built just based on the, the cohesion policy because otherwise we cannot have a, a Europe of future uh, damaging what Europe has proved that uh, to be right. Oh, with this multi-annual uh, framework it will be difficult to negotiate with the exiting of uh, the, the British but we have to answer in a positive way. And like the European Parliament uh, suggested, uh, we have more contribution from the member states. We are we agreed in uh, raising that uh, uh, contribution, but also more from the European Commission because we cannot ask the European Commission to do more without giving the European Commission resources to do more. So uh, we cannot just damage uh, what has been done well. We can only uh, we can only go ahead and be successful if we do more with more as well. What would you vote for, Prime Minister Costa? I know it's hard. I would have voted in todos. I would have voted in all of them. We can see the improving people's daily lives 57%. I really think that it's the most important goal because we, are, we don't do cohesion policy for the sake of cohesion policy. We do cohesion policy to improve the daily life of the people. For me, uh, uh, Mrs. Hubner said uh, it's the most beautiful policy. For me, it's a policy that it's the most human, the uh, uh, caring face of Europe. It's also uh, the, the policy that uh, bring Europe closer to the citizens. If you go, uh, as uh, you said, uh, we, we saw in Finland, there is no village, no region, no member states mm. where you don't see uh, 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 the, this, uh, this uh, flags with the, of European projects. So, so it's a solidarity in terms of financial term, in terms of financial. I'd like to add the following. Between the uh, economic uh, growth and solidarity, you can see that there's an inversion here because the cohesion policy has uh, contributed a lot for the economic development, not just for the countries and regions which have uh, ha been helped with the cohesion, but also to all the other regions. I'll give you an example. Uh, for the last 30 years, we have changed radically the profile of our economy. 30 years ago, exports represented 26% of our uh, GDP. Today, they represent 43% uh, of our GDP. And that has transformed radically our economy or the profile of our economy. And this, when you mention solidarity, and, and is very important. And that will help more convergence, because if we want to have a more a solid, solidar uh, share for the for the for the refugees, for example, they have to understand that they have uh, the same opportunities to build their future uh, in the rest of Europe as they have in Germany, for example. Because today it, it is difficult in these operations of. Uh, uh, bringing the refugees to different countries. People should have the idea that certain countries in Europe uh, where the infrastructures are very good and in other countries the infrastructure are less good. So we have to have a prison policy that reinforces the convergence and that is linked to economic uh, development. And we cannot decide there's a Europe of development and, and, uh, and cohesion. We have to be more competitive outside, but we have to be more uh, stronger inside, and that is 
will will depend on the cohesion policy and improving people's daily lives and to get the view from the local and regional level i would like to hear now from the members of the committee of the regions i do know that here with us today is kieran mccarthy could you please stand up so we could hear you and see you better and introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much and, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I am a, a city councillor uh, in Cork, uh, in the south of Ireland, uh, and we actually heard an awful lot about uh, Northern Ireland and the peace process. Uh, but in 2016, uh, my city was involved in signing a rural, an EU rural declaration um, about kind of building better lives. Um, and it was called Cork 2.0. And in that, um, I suppose there was a, a quest to connect up the European Regional Development Funds, the ERDF, um, and rural proofing. Um, and one of the major aspects that came out of that is the need for knowledge and competence centres, innovation centres, not just in urban areas, um, but also actually in rural areas. Uh, and in that, broadband uh, is, a, is a major thing. Um, and I, I have to say I very much welcome the new broadband competence centres um, that are going to be I suppose, uh, physically constructed uh, across the member states. I think one billion, one billion euros of ERDF funding is going to be invested in these broadband competence funds. Um, and can I say, from a rural perspective, broadband is very much needed. Um, broadband is an element, it's a reason why people actually are flocking into cities. It's a massive kind of depopulation. Um, I come from a city where I probably have, on average, two point. 2.0 to 3.0 gigabytes, um, but we, we say three kilometres out the road in the rural countryside, um, I have schools that don't have Skype facilities. Um, and that's just three kilometres out from a, an urban area. So we need more joined up thinking. Um, and that's just one region. You multiply that across all Commissioner Kretsu's uh, region and our regions. Um, and you've got major issues around, we say, speed levels, users, investors in broadband technology. Um, and so I very much welcome that Cohesion Fund is going to support broadband uh, and Cork 2.0 in the future. Uh, no, and into the future. Um, but those are my, my points, Madam uh, Moderator. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pavel Branda also with us from Committee of the Regions. Please, yeah, could you please stand up so we can see you better? Hello. Um, Pavel Branda, I'm uh, the deputy mayor of a small and beautiful municipality in the north of Czech Republic. Uh, I'm from the border region. I, I live in the border region bordering to Poland and Germany. I was born there and I was, I was grew, grown up there and I now raise my family there, so I'm, I'm a border person. And so I would like to share my personal witness of the Interreg and especially the cross-border cooperation and how it has transformed the region that has been at the periphery with all its problems of uh, having the closed borders into a region that has the border as an advantage. Uh, I remember growing up, it was called the Black, Black Triangle. Uh, when the snow, snow fell, it stayed white for a few minutes because the wind blew from Germany and Poland from the power stations and it turned yellow and, and, and grey after a while. But we had also the Nyssa River that starts from the Czech Republic, goes back to Germany and Poland. So, and it had different color every day. Uh, I, I remember because I was drowning in the fourth grade in, in that river. And now uh, I can go canoeing and we have trout in the, uh, in, in the river. Uh, to go to the neighboring uh, village just across the river, you had to go 70 kilometers to, to the border crossing and, and go back. Now uh, you can hike in the forest and you cross the border without even having a control. So, uh, now we have, for example, a university, a uh, common virtual university where you can study one year in Germany, one year in Poland, and one year in the Czech Republic, and then get a joint degree. We have a single ticket that you can use uh, public transport with in all three countries. But also, I think also the great advantage of Interreg is that it also invests in people-to-people -people relationships. And I think we cannot uh, stress this uh, importance enough. Uh, it helps overcoming prejudices from the past, uh, borders with difficult history, and builds trust. And I think this is the best uh, example of spending EU money because you can do a lot with a little limited budget and there's great at EU added value. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing your example. And we are ready to hear more. And uh, a large part, as we discussed, a large part of cohesion policy is implemented through the Regional Development Fund. And many of those investments are indeed implemented at the level of the regions. So we've heard already and we're going now to hear voice from the regions. We're being joined with the one to one by Johanna Mikleitner, president of the region of Lower Austria, joining us live from Vienna. 
Hello? Hi. Development in the level. What is in for the regions? Well, uh, Lower Austria is uh, the biggest uh, region. We have the largest superficy around Vienna, for example. We have um, an area with a very high growth. It is amongst the region that grows very fastly in Europe. We, uh, we also do have contact with the borders, um, with the Republic, uh, the Czech Republic and uh, with Slovakia, and we need to have better transportation, railways and so on. And we need broad broadband as well. We need to invest in uh, uh, research and development and in technology. And the last years, we were quite successful with a lot of projects, thanks to the cohesion policy. Uh, in our region, we were really successful and we could flourish and we could evolve to have a brain drain from the rural region, thanks to those funding. And when I remember 2015, well, there was trust. You know, there was a lack of trust because of the refugees. And we had to get the trust back, thanks to those projects. Uh, the European Union is more visible and there is more trust back. In your region, what expectations for the next financial period? What are my expectations? So, well, uh, uh, after uh, 2020, well, I hope uh, we will take uh, on other uh, initiative uh, to maintain everything that we have achieved thanks to the cohesion policy. Um, so we have uh, 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 22 uh, uh, percent, and we want to regain that trust. And uh, we also want to launch new projects. It is very important for us to be able to go on with that kind of policy. So thank you for being here with us today. Einen Zusatz, wenn ich noch anbringen darf, wichtig wäre mir vor allem auch. I'd like to add something. You know, we need to 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 have uh, uh, less bureaucracy. We. If uh, this is an expectation for the future, of course we have. We, we need to have uh, uh, enough uh, a control, but less bureaucracy. This is what I would like uh, to have. By Karen Wangard, Mayor of Stockholm, to hear his city perspective on cohesion policy and the urban agenda, which you, Commissioner, have you have just noted like, just now. Let's. We're going to hear from her just in a, in a couple of uh, just in a couple of moments. We're getting there connected because it's the live connection. What's the importance of the urban agenda before we hear from the mayor of Stockholm? First of all, I think, uh, as I said, that uh, it is um, now time that we have this framework when we have to we can help mayors directly under the urban agenda. We have, uh, we have designed this we, under the Dutch presidency, under my mandate, and I think it is one of the greatest achievements. We have 12 partnerships uh, uh, designed from the very beginning about poverty, fighting poverty, uh, of course, uh, air pollution, and uh, we have for each migration, for each uh, partnership, we have a network of cities interesting. And for instance, Brussels is leading uh, the partnership from air pollution. Athens is leading now uh, uh, the partnership for migration. Uh, last week, we have decided to introduce a new uh, partnership on uh, urban security because we have this new uh, priority to assure the security of the citizens. Uh, and uh, until uh, in October, uh, cities could apply for uh, projects and we made uh, money available for these 13 uh, 
partnerships. The urban agenda is very important, but I would like to say that this link between urban and rural is mm. also important, which was highlighted here by the president, by the cities, and is very important because, uh, as uh, we see, we have an uh, urban agenda, of course, we have a large concentration of population, many problems, we find solutions in the cities, but we cannot afford to have uh, large uh, urban agglomerations and empty countries. So we have to do something to convince people to live also in the rural areas. And I think broadband, as uh, uh, the, uh, the representative of the Committee of the Region said here, it's very important in order to help people to uh, do some businesses because without internet, it's our common goal of me and Commissioner Hogan to work together until our mandate all the uh, uh, rural and urban areas to be covered by broadband. Thank you very much. And we are ready to hear from Karine Wengert, Mayor of Stockholm. She joins us, yes, live from Stockholm right now. Good afternoon. Uh, hello, good afternoon. Sweden is among the richer EU countries in terms of GDP per capita. Why should the EU continue investing in your city and in cities in the EU in general? Thank you. Let me highlight two points. One, in Stockholm, EU-funded projects are often the most visible link between citizens and the EU. This is a very important link, and it should not be ignored. As the mayor of one of Europe's most innovative cities, and as vice president of EuroCities, I know how beneficial the EU has been for Stockholm and for other cities, and how important a strong and stable EU will be for our future. But these benefits are not always as clear to our citizens. Cohesion policy has been the strongest expression of solidarity in the EU. And given the current political climate, a shared cohesion policy for all cities and regions may be import more important mm -hmm. than ever. And second, regarding the urban agenda, in my opinion, cities have an essential role to play when it comes to developing EU policies, especially today with globally rising inequalities and a general lack of trust in the ability of politicians to solve the pressing issues at hand. Cities are the level of government closest to citizens. And cities like Stockholm can provide national and EU leaders with vital information about the needs on the ground and the opportunities. With our expertise, we can help develop more effective legislation that delivers meaningful results. Results that help our citizens to tackle their da daily challenges. That is also what is needed to help the EU reconnect with its citizens. And very briefly, I would like to ask you, what do you expect from cohesion policy in the next financial period? Yes, again, let me give you two examples. One, the latest cohesion report clearly underlines the importance of cities as drivers of sustainable growth in Europe. The report also highlights the positive spillover effects of city investments to the surrounding regions. These findings are in line with my own experiences. So, the coming EU budget will need a strong urban dimension to be effective. And the share of the budget for sustainable urban development should increase. Second, cohesion policy has been very beneficial for Stockholm, but we also see a clear need for simplification. We have taken considerable measures to combine ESI funds, but the current structure is making it very difficult. 
The challenges we are facing require cross-sectoral solutions. And in my view, a single fund that combines ERDF and ESF would have a much better chance at creating mm. a lasting structural impact in our cities. Thank you very much. Live from Stockholm, Mayor of Stockholm, Karin Wenger, thank you for being here with us. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. And I would like to invite now on stage Karl Heinz Lamberts, President of the European Committee of the Regions. The <laughs> Please, you've been here with us, you've been following the debate. What's your take, Tisha? I'm very enthusiastic. First of all, this is a sheer pleasure to, to meet three of our former commissioners. I've been working with them for quite a long time. And I've seen that everyone is heavily committed in this cohesion policy. Indeed, some people say nowadays that the cohesion policy is a policy from the past. It's true. We had a lot of successes in the past. However, the cohesion policy is a policy of the future. It has shown that cities, regions, nations can work together. They can converge and promote development. The challenges, the future challenges must be tackled in the same way. This is why we need more than ever a strong cohesion policy, as it has been said several times today. And we need all the regions and all the cities to take part into it. So thank you very much. We always had in the Committee of the Regions the uh, most important partner and uh, we work hand in hand together. I am very uh, grateful to, to, uh, to, to you, Mr. President, because we have launched together this Cohesion Alliance. Uh, according with our studies, uh, more than 70% of the population, they don't know when they go in a hospital or in a, in a school or on the highway that uh, these uh, things are done with European money. So we have decided together uh, to, uh, to, to make beneficiaries to speak, because of course we are here to defend cohesion policy. But I think the most convincing are people who are really benefit for, for this. And uh, 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 tomorrow morning we will present uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, these results from uh, public consultations that we had, uh, and uh, for uh, we have to speak loudly about what cohesion policy is doing. And uh, uh, as, as the mayor of uh, Stockholm said, uh, for me, I think it's very important to, to show that uh, cohesion policy is not only about money. It's also about um, administrative capacity. Sometimes we have money in Brussels, but we don't have high quality projects. And what uh, Prime Minister Costa hi highlighted it, uh, and also the mayor, is that uh, we have this unique feature that uh, we allow regions and cities to have their own program according, uh, programs according with their own uh, needs. So uh, under the urban agenda, because you have asked me, for the first time in the history of cohesion policy, uh, the cities, they have uh, direct funds they, uh, they could uh, design, select, and implement themselves the projects. Uh, it's, a, it's a sign of trust for the European Commission to give directly to the cities uh, the, uh, this money to be managed directly by the city. So I think it's very important, and uh, 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 we are working together to, to, to share good practices, which, in my view, are sometimes more important than money. We have here countries like Portugal and uh, also Belgium, Germany, who are using this money for 45 mm. years. We we'll live in the hands of the history where the Eastern European countries will be if they would use this money for, uh, for, for so, so much time. Uh, but uh, in the same time, we have to be solidar and exchanging also good practices mm. in using EU funds.
Prime Minister Costa, let's together launch uh, another slide vote, and I very much want you to answer it as well. You'll have to choose just two options, as everybody else here, and okay. we will all as well do. So the question is the following. Please take your phones and go to slide to vote. The question is the following. What should cohesion policy's main priorities be in the future? This is what we have discussed now. Research and innovation, industrial transition, climate change, energy transition, environment protection, mobility, digital connectivity, a more social Europe, or migrants integration. These are the aspects we have discussed, some of them right now, also with our one-to-one. -one. Prime Minister Costa, what's your vote? You can choose two. Two. Yes. Innovation. Well, innovation and a more social Europe. Vote now, Commissioner. Um, two. You know, we only have to choose two. Commissioner, maybe you allow me to obtain because we are doing already for, uh, each of them. We do research, we do innovation, we have industrial transition in regions climate change, we are dealing with this, uh, environment is very important. Uh, but as President said, uh, Prime Minister said, I see a more social Europe is very important and also social integration in general, it's also very important. Your take on so social I cannot integration, choose. I understand. <laughs> you excuse me, c'est une mauvaise question. I'm sorry, but I think this is a bad question. Indeed, the particularity of the uh, cohesion policy is to combine in a smart way those different policies and to put them in a tailor-made uh, way in all the regions. And what matters in the region may not matter in another one. But all those goals are the goals that we should promote in Europe. And the cohesion policy enables us to adapt ourselves to the uh, particularities of each region. This is why we need to smartly combine all those different elements. I will not give any choice about that. Well, so 52% research and innovation, industrial transition. We have discussed. 43% climate change and energy transition, of course, another very important aspect and the priority which we have uh, mentioned here. Environment protection, 18, yes, please. As I said, uh, in the last year, we, are, we faced uh, a lot of tragedies because of this climate change. Mm. Uh, in Portugal, in Madeira, in, uh, in Italy with the earthquake. Uh, so... Well, innovation is cross-cutting uh, because in none of the other objectives is able to be reached uh, without innovation, that's for sure. And uh, uh, climate change as well goes through a more protection of the environment. So these uh, objectives are cross-cutting. Um, they are just they combine. And you are right. Uh, we have to preserve governance at the, at the different levels because this is the way to guarantee the efficiency. Because certain policies have to be followed at the EU level, others at the national level, but others at regional or even local level. And uh, several of these uh, objectives, we have to understand that we, they have to be integrated. Uh, the idea of cohesion should also be present uh, uh, when we talk about Horizon uh, 2020, which is fundamental for innovation. But innovation cannot just be focused on those most favoured uh, um, regions, but well, the opposite should have a spilled over effect from the cohesion policy and uh, a factor that reinforces the cohesion within the EU. And the issue of security is not just for uh, the national level. The cohesion policy contributes to reinforce security. The urban policies reinforces security, urban uh, security. Uh, urban regeneration can also contribute to prevent uh, radicalization and terrorism. We have with we are thinking about borders to defend ourselves from terrorism, but I think that all the, the terrorist attacks that uh, has, have occurred in Europe were not done by people coming from outside Europe. There were people who were born or at least were brought up inside Europe. So socially inclusion is a fundamental tool to prevent uh, uh, radicalization and fight against terrorism. And here the cohesion policy is the size of 
and also at the local, but mainly at the urban level. Members of the European Parliament who are here with us this afternoon, Maria Spiraki, please, could you stand up a little bit? We could see you better. Good afternoon. Thank you for giving me the floor. Well, first of all, I come from a country which is one of the, of the, it is the first beneficiary country for, for cohesion and for CAP as well. So it is important, first of all, to start discussing, expressing solidarity. How can we express solidarity? Not only by sharing funding, but also by sharing responsibility. And it is important in the regard of refugee crisis. Secondly, it is important to have flexibility. We face a huge tragedy in Mandra, in Attica, but we cannot have any kind of, uh, of EU funding due to the regulation. And maybe we have to, have to reconsider regulation, especially concerning urgent situations. Third, it is the, the regard of post-MFF after 2020. It is important to say that we have to stick on our traditional, traditional priorities like cohesion, but also to include migration, defence uh, and uh, others. And it is important to know how can we do more with less, because we have to be realistic. Nobody is ready to go on and to add more than 1.1 per cent to this, to this budget. So it is important to, to start discussing additionality. And now I would like to make a proposal to the Commissioner who is, who is here. I would like to ask you, Commissioner, to launch a kind of campaign to take on not only national authorities, not only local authorities, but the people, the stakeholders, and of course the Commission, in order to explain the added values of cohesion projects and in order to involve not only financial instruments but the private sector as well. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Thank floor. you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Mrs. Piraki is always full of ideas and a very enthusiastic member of European Parliament. We work together and uh, one of the uh, achievements, I think, of my, of my mandate uh, will, uh, it is that we... Uh, we, we helped Greece a lot. I was in front of European Parliament to, to help this country, and we have achieved in times of very big crisis to, to make 100% co-financing. So now we deblocked all, all the uh, programs in Greece. So thanks to our work. But uh, regarding your, your proposal, of course we can do better, but we already launched together with uh, Karl Heinz and the Committee of the Regions this cohesion alliance, which put together also, as you said, business people, NGOs, population, because they are the ones that are benefiting of, of this cohesion uh, policy funds. We were together in, uh, in some uh, so deprived uh, uh, areas in Greece, and uh, we know very well that we have to speak more about what, uh, what uh, this European funds uh, is doing. We have to find a way. So that's why, for instance, I am very grateful to you, to Euronews, because sometimes in many member states, um, internal battles and uh, uh, political battles uh, 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 not allow us to speak about big things, important things, European things. And I really uh, think that it's very important to highlight what we are doing in each country. And uh, of course, we take on board your proposal um, uh, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll do hope, hopefully better. And, and we've got uh, just a few more brief comments and then we can discuss it. Please, Kerstin and Westfall, that's your time. You're gonna get the mic right now. Please, share your view. Ja, vielen Dank für die Einladung, vielen Dank für die Konferenz. Hier sind Thank you for the conference. We are here to talk about uh, the cohesion policy and uh, we've seen what it has achieved, how successful it is, and uh, we have also seen what it could achieve in the future, but we're not there yet. And I'm here before you because I'm the rapporteur as well about those uh, uh, policies. And uh, I had the, the honor to be uh, uh, present to discuss the future of Europe, the future of the regions. It is very important, and it means for me, for me personally, that solidarity in Europe uh, should be everywhere. 
it is very important. And there are people in Germany that are ready to pay more money for the cohesion uh, policy uh, than, uh, and, uh, than our uh, uh, President uh, Martin Schulz. But there are also other countries that want to show the solidarity because we wanted to uh, each and every region. So we want to have more inclusion everywhere because just as you said, and that's what we've, uh, we've heard from uh, our citizens, from the skeptical people, from the conservative one. When we see the anti-European people, when we have to explain to them about the cohesion policy and the, the, the European Social Fund, that they are, they are the answer Europe needs and Europe is really what we need. And I would like to, to make a suggestion to the Commissioner. We have to, uh, to present Europe. We have uh, 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 Merkel, and uh, Merkel is really a cornerstone in uh, this cohesion policy. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. I would like to thank Commissioner Cretu for her commitment, but also ask her one more um, effort in attention to uh, while she reviews the cohesion policy for the next period to bring attention to all those regions that are still uh, left behind in the development. They need the cohesion policy more than others. So while reviewing the MFF for the next period, I am sure that Commissioner Cretu will do everything in her power to accompany those regions in administrative procedures as well, because very often those who most need the cohesion policy are also those who are have less access to the funds coming from the cohesion policy. And one last request as a journalist, if we really want to fight against populism and we want to give the sense to our citizens of what Europe is and how useful it is, we need to communicate uh, more and better the good results of the cohesion policy because everyone needs to be aware that Europe is fundamental. We need it. Thank you. Yes, I think this is a, a real phenomenon. You know, this. Uh, well, well, I've been a president of the Committee of, of, of Region since uh, 2001, and I've already voted a lot of uh, opinions, and it's the very first time that the whole of Europe mobilizes. We have most of the European population ma 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 taking part uh, um, in those uh, participative meetings, and to, tomorrow, uh, tomorrow morning, we'll have the possibility to celebrate that more than uh, 4,000 people, more than 100 region, almost 100 uh, uh, cities are committing themselves. And I, I, when I can see the people, when they come to us to sign or to give the contribution, I can see them. And, you know, it's a great moment because we, we can discuss. There is a real debate because they are really convinced that thanks to cohesion policy, they will be able to do something useful for their population and useful for Europe as well. And I think this is the main point. This is crucial. Everyone should understand that Europe is not Brussels. Even if it's nice, you know, in Brussels, it's not Luxembourg, it's not Strasbourg, not at all. Europe is where the citizen, the European citizen, live, in their village, in the city, in their region. And the cohesion policy is a policy that can be implemented there in the field. And there we can make the difference and we can prove that the European Union has a real added value. Well, the cohesion policy is the, the, the policy that brought Europe to the everyday life of the citizens. Uh, more competitiveness for the, the, the industries or the companies, more solidarity and uh, the ability to be more competitive uh, outside. And this is why it's curious that in this last uh, vote, the innovation was first. Uh, with its own program, uh, funded actually by Horizon 2020, and people are aware that more and more we need to combine all these options or objectives because it's not we cannot be more competitive without innovation 
and we cannot be more cohesive without more uh, solidarity. And this is the reason why the cohesion policy will be have to be more and more focused on people and should be a uh, instrument a finance uh, uh, instrument in the new uh, MMF without losing this dimension to be able to work in the governance in different level at least different levels in the municipal at local level or national level or European level which are key for the governance of Europe. And I'd like to thank uh, uh, Commissioner Kretu for the capacity to mobilize us all, uh, national governments, uh, committee of regions, uh, uh, population, uh, defending the cohesion policy, because uh, we all want a Europe which is capable to answer the challenges, but we do not want Europe to lose of all the things and forget all the things that has been done well. This is the reason why we should focus on the cohesion policy. And on everything you've heard First of here. All, I would like to thank you all, uh, to, the, to you, Mr. Prime Minister, to you, Mr. President, to the former commissioners, to the President of the European Commission, but also to the members of the uh, European Parliament and uh, 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 not last, uh, Euroid News and uh, uh, Digirigio, my services. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we did a great job today. We, um, we could sh uh, show how important cohesion policy is in the life of the people. Of course, we are aware that we have to modernize ourselves. We have to be more flexible. We have to be able to respond to the shocks and to the crisis that could arrive in uh, any moment. But at the same time, uh, we have to preserve what we have built, as you say, so here, over and over the years. Since 75, when this ERDF was created, this uh, policy increased the number of jobs uh, and uh, being, well-being of the, of, the of the human beings. So I really think that the message is that uh, we need uh, cohesion more than ever. Uh, I think during these times of uh, so unpredictability and uh, so much unpredictability and uh, uncertainties and also with uh, this uh, political landscape which is uh, so dynamic, changing, cohesion policy, it's a pillar, it's a solid uh, uh, proof that we can uh, look forward for the next 30 years of cohesion policy and uh, I hope of course our, uh, uh, the, the next commissioner, the next president, the next prime minister could be uh, in front of the population to show after 30 years, yes, this policy survived uh, under all the circumstances. Thank you once again to all of you. Thank you very much and on this note. Thank you, Commissioner Kretzer. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. President, for being with us on stage and everybody who was here. Thank you very much for being here with us today, this afternoon here at Atelier de Tenor. And thank you all very much for watching this live talk show. Thank you. On this note, goodbye. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you. Congratulations.